Once upon a time, the ancients wove tales of awe and wonder round bonfires and house fires to entertain and educate, and for adults, perhaps, to titillate. In this edition of AIB Presents, we host a private storytelling gathering in the sanctuary of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Atlanta to hear a variety of tales from some of Atlanta's finest story spinners, members of the Southern Order of Storytellers, some featured in the 2015 Peach State Storytelling Festival in Atlanta. We begin with a tongue twister using what's called spoonerisms in a familiar tale told by Anthony Vinson. I want to share the story of the pre-little thrigs. Now, upon Totona Wyme, there were pre-little thrigs, and they must have been millennials because they were still living at home with their parents, Foppa Fig and Pama Mig. But one fine day, they decided to head out into the world and feek their sorchins. Now, that purse little frig, he met a man with a lagging woad of stress fra. And he said, Mister, would you sell me that stress fra? I'm going to heal me a hall strauss. And that's exactly what he did. But no sooner had he finished than along comes the wig wad boof, who said, Piddlig, piddlig, et me lin. Not by the chair of my henny hen hen. <laughs> then I'll puff and I'll huff and I'll hoo ear blouse down. <laughs> and that's just what he did. And as soon as he had finished, he reached into the rubble, he plucked out that piddle leg, and he boom, hollowed him swole. Hoof, line, and stinker. <laughs> now that second piddle leg, he met a man with a lag and wold of stong licks. And he said, Mr. Sell me those stong licks, I'm going to heal me a big stouse. And that's just what he did. Well, of course, no sooner had he finished, and along comes the wigwad bull, who said, Piddleig, Piddleig, let me in. Not by the chin of my hairy hair hair. Then I'll puff and I'll huff and I'll hold ear blouse down. And that's just what he did. And when he'd finished, he reached into the rubble, grabbed that peccant little cig, and he <laughs> hollowed him swole. That purred little thrig, he was a fart smeller. <laughs> and he went down to the local dome hepo and he bought himself a big breast of mix and he hilt himself a mick bouse. It was a beauty. It was two Tories. It had a pap around rorch with feeling sands and chalking rares and up on top, a tall chick brimney. Well, no sooner had he finished up than along comes the wigwad bull who said, Piddleig, Piddleig, et me lin. Not by the chin of my hurry here, here, said the Piddleig. And the wolf said, then I'll puff and I'll huff and I'll hold ear blouse down. Well, he puffed and he huffed, he huffed and he puffed until his base turned flu but he couldn't hoe down that blouse. So he decided there's more than one way to kin a scat. So he climbed up on the roof, or maybe he rhymed up on the kloof and decided he would try down that slimney. But that piddle leg, he figured out what that oof was up to, and he ran to the kitchen and got a big wad of pouring butter. And he put it into the pyre place. And when that bull came down that chimney and hit that water while he was he was boiling mad. He was also good and dead. And that purred little thrig ran back into the kitchen and he got a long nutcher bife. And he slit that wolf from turns to stem. And he trescued his brew truthers. And from that fade doorward, they have to neverly have a Next, Betty Ann Wiley offers a modern midrash, a story based on a story in the Bible. So the story that I'm going to tell is from Rabbi Mark Gelman's book. His book is a collection of original midrashim. The title of the book is 
Does God have a big toe? And if that doesn't make you want to pick up a book and read it, nothing will. The story that I'm going to tell is actually the prologue to the stories in the book, and it is titled Partners. Before there was anything, there was God and just a few Angels, oh. angels, and there was a great swirling glob of rocks and water with no place to go. And the angels came to God and they said, God, why don't you clean up this mess? <laughs> So God collected rocks from that great swirling glob and he made them into clumps of rocks. And God said, now, some of these clumps of rocks are going to be stars. And some of these clumps of rocks are going to be planets. And he took some dust and he took some water and he made a man. And he made a woman. And God said to the man and the woman, I'm tired now. Would you please help me finish up the world? And the man and the woman said, who? Us? Finish up the world? You're the one who has the plan. And, and besides, we're too little. And God said, you're big enough. And I tell you what, if you'll promise to help me finish up the world, I'll be your partner. And the man and the woman said, partner? Well, what's a partner? And God said, a partner is someone you work with when you have a job to do that's so big, you really can't do it all by yourself. And when you have a partner, you can never quit trying because your partner is depending on you. So if you'll be my partner on those days when I don't think you're trying to do enough to finish up the world and on those days when I don't think you're doing enough to finish up the world, we won't stop trying because we're partners. And the man and the woman and God agreed to that deal. And those angels came. And they said, God, is it finished now? And God said, don't ask me. Go ask my partners. And boy, did those partners have stories to tell. And that's one of the lessons found in this tale shared by B.J. Abraham. There once was a philanthropist who, on his business, for his business, he traveled all around the world. And when he would go into different countries, he would like to stay a few extra days or go a few extra days early and get in touch with the local people to see how he could help out in ways that they might be poor or might need help. Once, when he traveled to Africa, he stayed and visited a little village. He saw that the people were needy, but they were so pleasant and so happy. They were laid back. They received him well. He liked the spirit that he felt there. He found out that just that very week, they were beginning to install, for the first time ever, electricity in this little village. The people were excited. They didn't really know what it would bring to them, actually, but they were excited about it. So he went away thinking, what can I do for these people that they're going to have electricity now? Life will change so much for them. I know. I will get them all TV sets. They live in these little huts, but I think they could make room for a television set. I know they'll never visit other parts of the world, some of them can't even speak English, but with the television set, the world will come to them. They'll get to visit exotic places without 
ever having to leave their hut. That's what he did. He, he ordered the televisions and he stayed actually a few more days to see that they were installed. Everything went fine. And as he went from hut to hut, he saw the people sitting there. They were glued to the television sets. They had smiles on their faces. They were enjoying it. They were being educated. He felt so gratified when he left. Well, he happened to be back in that same area of Africa about a year later. He was eager to visit the village and to see how the people were receiving this new thing, the television. So he looked in the first hut. He didn't see anybody in there, nor did he see a television. He went to the next hut. No person, no television. Hut after hut. And then finally, he saw all of the televisions piled up in one hut. What had happened? Had he been sold a bunch of lemons? Maybe none of them worked. But he noticed that he didn't see any people walking up and down the road either. Where was everybody? Finally, he saw a native walking toward him. He greeted him, and fortunately, the man spoke pretty good English. Where are all the people? The televisions are piled up in the huts. There's no people around. He looked a little sheepish when he answered the philanthropist. Well, the people are gathered together in a circle in the village. They are listening to the storyteller, the village storyteller. The storyteller, but the television knows hundreds more stories than the storyteller. Ah, yes. But you see, the storyteller knows us. What story lurks beneath this tombstone, part of the Lawrenceville Ghost Tour? It's brought to life by storyteller Cynthia Rente. One afternoon in 1850, Philadelphia Wynn walks into the town's only saloon. Um, that didn't really get the reaction that I was expecting. You see, Philadelphia Wynn was the finest lady in all of Lawrenceville. And in the 1850s, ladies did not walk into saloons. Only women did, if you understand the difference. So let's try that again. One afternoon. In 1850, Philadelphia Wynn walks into the town's only saloon, <laughs> causing those gathered to gasp. She walks up to the bartender and she says to him, you are never to serve my son that demon liquor again. It seems that her grown son had grown over fond of imbibing. That very night, Philadelphia Wynn is doing needlework by her fire when she hears this eerie sound. It's kind of like a, a moaning or wailing or off-key singing, and it's getting closer and closer. Suddenly, her door bursts open, and there is her son, drunk as a skunk, promptly passes out on her Persian rug. Without saying a word, Philadelphia Wynn goes over and grabs her husband's walking stick, his special walking stick, marches out of the house. A few minutes later, she marches into that bar late at night, causing all those drunks to laugh. The laughter promptly stops when Philadelphia Wynn takes the walking stick and smashes the nearest liquor bottle. The bartender whirs around from behind the bar and is about to ungently remove Philadelphia Wynn from the premises when she takes that walking stick and from the handle pulls out a knife. Remember, I told you this was her husband's special walking stick. She points the knife at that bartender and she says to him, if you lay one of your dirty hands on me, I will run you through. The bartender backs away. Philadelphia Wynn resheathes the knife. Now realize what I'm about to tell you 
has been known to make grown men scream like frightened little schoolgirls. Philadelphia win proceeds to smash each and every bottle of liquor in the only saloon in Lawrenceville. <gasps> and to this day, we can still hear a eerie whining. And we've never been able to figure out if it's the sound of all those drunks who realized they were gonna have to sober up or the sound of Philadelphia Wind's son dying of mortal embarrassment. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Personal stories from childhood take us back in time too. And this one shared by Esther Culver offers a message for all ages. The name of this story is Partners in Crime. When I was a little girl, I used to love to go to Rich's department store downtown Atlanta. My 13-year-old sister would grab me by the hand and we'd walk into Rich's department and I'd grab away from her and run to the water fountain because the water at Rich's tasted better than the water at home. One day, there was another little girl dashing to the water fountain. We almost collided. I looked at her, and she looked at me, and I knew she was six years old. You know how I knew? <laughs> because her two front teeth were missing just like mine. She had on a simplicity number 2687 dress. You know how I knew? because I had on a simplicity number 2687 dress. Mine was red, white, and blue plaid with puff sleeves, wide skirt, a bow in the back, pearl buttons down the front, and a white PK collar. Hers was red, yellow, and blue. Why, she had bangs and I had bangs. She had two braids with red ribbons and I had two braids with one ribbons. Why, we were twins. Suddenly, our twin minds knew that we would be partners in crime. She looked over my shoulder to see if anybody was watching and I looked over hers and then we dashed to the water fountain. Ooh, I was disappointed. I thought it would taste like vanilla taffy. I love vanilla taffy. I looked at my partner and I could tell she was disappointed too. I bet she thought it would taste like chocolate. Suddenly, our older sisters pulled us away from the wrong water fountain. I looked at her, my partner with her big blue eyes, and she looked at me. Oh, I had those sparkling browns, and we smiled our toothless smiles, because we knew what our sisters did not know. <laughs> We knew what the whole world did not know. Colored water and white water tasted just the same. Walking in someone else's shoes is part of the message of a story shared by Mary Williams. This is a story about a woodcutter and his wife. Now they had been married a long time. And for a long time, every day when he went out to the forest to cut wood, he would say the same thing to her. Your job is easier than mine. So one day she said, tell you what, tomorrow we will swap jobs. He thought, that's a great idea. I'm going to have an easy day. So the next morning she went out early to cut wood and he went back to bed. Now she'd left a list of things for him to do, but he figured, you know, it won't take that long to bake bread, make the butter, 
make soup, feed the cow. That can't take that long. So when he got up, the sun was very high in the sky, and he decided he better make the bread. So he did. He kind of threw it together, threw it in the oven, and went back to bed. He awoke to the smell of burned bread. Ah, guess we're not having bread for supper tonight. He thought, you know, I guess I better make the butter. That might take a while. So he has the butter churn there, and he has the milk, and he puts it in and starts the motion of the plunger. And he said, you know, this is going to take a while, and my arm's getting tired. There has to be a better way. I've got an idea. So he put the butter churn on his back and kind of walked around, you know, thought that would agitate it. That would work. Yeah, this will work. It's great. You know, and while I'm doing this, I'm going to go down to the spring and I'm going to get two buckets of water for the soup. So that's what he did. He agitated all the way down to the spring. And when he got down there with his buckets, he leaned over to get the water. And that clabbered milk came right over his shoulder and into the spring guess we're not having butter tonight either. And so he brought back two milky buckets of water. When he got there, he thought, you know, I haven't fed the cow yet. She's going to be home soon. Let me get the soup on. So he got the soup ready. And then he went to get the cow. Now the cow was in her pen and he thought, you know, hmm, there's grass on our roof, and it slopes all the way. I'll just put her on the roof. That's what I'll do. It's perfect. So he convinces the cow, leading her by the rope, to get up where the roof is, and she begins to munch, and she is so happy. Well, he thought, you know, she might run off. So he tied a rope around the cow and ran it down the chimney, put it around his waist so she couldn't get away. Well, about the time he began to really stoke the fire to really get the soup going, the cow fell off the roof, yanking him up into the fireplace. He is dangling there over the fire. And fortunately, his wife comes home right at that moment. She cuts him down, and he is there singed. His pride is totally broken. And he looks at his wife, and he says, You know, honey, your job isn't easier than mine. Shannon Turner is a purveyor of a popular form of telling, reality stories. My story is about uh, an episode that happened to me in middle school. When I was growing up, my parents really wanted to instill in me a sense of responsibility. We had enough, but they wanted to make sure that I felt like I was participating in enough. So when there was a trip coming up through my school, they would say, I will give you half but you have to earn the other half. And I could come up with whatever means necessary in order to earn that half. So I became a Red Cross certified babysitter and I filled out many handwritten little postcards and put them in all the boxes in my neighborhood and let people know that I was available for babysitting. I also made my own advertisements to all of my teachers to let them know that I was available for desk cleaning and plant watering after school. And one of my favorite teachers took me up on that very position. So I washed her desks very carefully and meticulously, taking away all of the pencil scratchings and watered her plants for a semester to get ready for our big East Coast trip. And to thank me for my service at the end of that semester, she went to a local record store and said, I would like to buy a cassette tape for my student that I love so much. She was not so into these things, and so she said, what would you buy for a 12-year-old girl? And she emerged with a cassette tape for a band called RAT, R-A-T-T. And to this day, I cannot tell you much about this band except for it was not something that I would personally have listened to, and that it was something that a group of young hoodlums on my bus did listen to. <laughs> now, the reason why I found this out is because they overheard me when I was on the bus that day saying, I got this tape from my teacher and I'm so tickled that she gave it to me that she wanted to give me something, but I have no idea what I'm going to do. So this young man named Moose, who weighed 205 pounds when we were in the fourth grade, leaned over to me and said, I will buy that tape from you tomorrow for $6. I'll meet you before lunch and we can exchange. 
I should have known something was up because Moose hadn't said anything to me since the day we were in the fourth grade when he was demonstrating break dancing and he ran and slid into our teacher's desk and put a dent in it and I helped him to go down to the nurse's station. But I was a nerd and I wanted desperately to win the approval of everyone that I knew. So I met him at the next day and unfortunately he brought a gang of hoodlums with him. And I felt very cornered. We were the only people in the hall. So they said, where's the tape? And I said, it's here. I said, where's the money? They said, it's here. They made me give them the tape though before they actually produced the money and then they took off. Now, I should have just let it go. In the grand scheme of things, it was $6. But that was a lot of money to me and that was what I was gonna put toward my East Coast trip. So I took off running as if we were playing football. And it was very much like a big football game because they faked off like one of them had the money but the other one didn't. And at the last minute, I lunged like I was gonna actually tackle this guy. But he looked back and saw that I was coming and he ducked down. And so I flew over this kid's shoulders and my glasses went flying and they flew into a locker and shattered and I landed directly on my face on carpet getting carpet burn over 40% of my face. Unfortunately, a few days later, I had to do a presentation in math class about the Fibonacci sequence. And so that morning I woke up and I tried to cover up the carpet burn with makeup, which immediately turned green with all the scabbing and oozing. And so then in order to cover up my mistake, right before the presentation, I made a mask for myself out of paper that was folded and with scotch tape. <laughs> a teacher was not having it. She almost yelled at me and made me take off my mask in front of everyone. And so then I began to cry, but I made it through my presentation about the Fibonacci sequence. And when it was over, I heard And I got a slow building clap for the first time in my life. And so I triumphed over the hoodlums. It was a very good day. <laughs> the future may very well rest in these reality tales and in events that center on them, like stories on the edge of night, stories from lived experience that anyone can share.